good start. Uh, so we have a little bit to finish up from last time. And if you remember where we stopped, actually, one quick announcement first. So on Wednesday, we're going to have uh, two very special guest lecturers. Um, their names are uh, Joshua and Dan. Um, so they're going to do the lectures on um, personal genomics and DNA printer fingerprinting. So um, give them the same kind of rapt attention that you give me. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's all I want to say. Okay, so finishing up from last time, we ended with, with this slide, which was talking about how one particular type of cancer, a leukemia, um, called CML, um, has a really, really, really good treatment now because of genomic information that was brought to bear on the problem and this drug Gleevec. Um, and so I highly recommend that on your DNAi DVD you take a look at these clips which go into a little bit more detail about that. Um, but what we're going to talk about today more is, um, is situations where it's not quite so clear cut, where it's not like you find some genetic uh, difference between individuals and knowing that genetic difference allows you to treat um, affected individuals with, you know, this amazing success like, like Gleevec has. We're going to talk about cases where um, it's a little bit fuzzier, where there's some um, diagnostic information that comes from using genomics, but it's not 100 percent. Yeah. Louder? Yeah. Sorry. Is that better? Okay. Sorry. All right. So we're going to get to, is it too loud? Or is it okay? Okay. Okay. Um, so we're going to get to the diagnosis stuff um, in a little bit. And one of the examples we're going to use is actually from this next slide, which is from last week's uh, lecture, um, about a different type of leukemia called diffuse large B cell lymphoma, or DLBCL. Um, it's a common form of lymphoma, and um, what was recognized is that some patients respond really well to chemotherapy treatment when they have this disease, but some don't. Like, there's almost like there's two different patient populations when it comes to this disease. And part of the problem is if you look at the tumor cells in those patients, you still can't tell the difference. Like, you can't say, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. I'm going to turn it down. Um, you, you, even if you look at the tumor cells themselves, can you still hear me? Hear me? Okay. Um, you, you can't tell the cancers apart. So this is what the cells look like. Um, this purplish stain is showing you the actual cancer cells. Um, you can see why it's called large B cell lymphoma because these, these cells are really large compared to other white blood cells. Um, and so what we'll talk about today is how genomics has been used to try and re attack this problem of, of these apparently two different patient populations, but if you use standard biological methods like looking at cells under a microscope, you can't tell the difference between those patients. And then some people go through chemotherapy and, and respond fairly well to it, but some people go through chemotherapy and don't respond very well at all, and, and they suffer a lot just from the side effects of the chemotherapy. Okay, so we're going to talk about how genomics can be used to deal with a situation like that. Um, in general, um, this, this idea that you can use genomic information to help you treat patients um, is what's known as pharmacogenomics, okay, pharmaco from pharmacology, the idea that genomics will tell you something about the potential effectiveness or side effects of drugs, okay. And the idea is that um, it's been known for a long time that some drugs are more or less effective or have more or less harmful side effects depending on the person they're given to. Um, and in particular, what's of interest to us is that what might be different among those people is actually uh, their genotype, what alleles they have are particular genes, okay? And so one example is this drug called uh, warfarin, okay? It sounds like this really evil drug, right, warfare or something. The warf actually comes from like Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation or something, so it has nothing to do with warfare, okay? Although its original use was as a rat poison, okay? So this chemical was developed. Um, to get rid of rat problems, and it was discovered that uh, people who accidentally ingested it um, didn't die, and 
uh, it actually might have some useful properties because basically the way it acts is to prevent blood clotting. Okay? Um, and so this is a, a, it's a drug that's fairly commonly used now um, for, uh, as an anticoagulant as for people with um, cardiovascular problems. Okay? Um, and so you know, it prevents embolism, blockage of blood supply to vital organs. Okay, so it's a really useful drug now. Um, but it turns out that certain patients um, can basically bleed to death if they're given this drug. Okay? That is, the anticoagulant properties go too far and, the, and they can't stop bleeding. And it also turns out that there's an association between whether that happens and which version of a particular gene called CYP2C9 uh, the patients have. Okay, so there are different alleles of this gene, and if you have one allele, then you can tolerate this drug perfectly fine, and it's useful for treating various cardiovascular issues. Uh, but if you have the other allele of the gene, then you're at risk for, um, for this potentially fatal bleeding um, that occurs. And so if you could do a genetic test um, to tell which, which allele of the gene a particular patient has, you can avoid the problem of giving this drug to someone who really can't tolerate it. Because before this test was available, you pretty much had to do trial and error. You had to give the drug and, and, and watch out. And, and sometimes, um, no matter how careful the doctors were, it didn't work out very well at all. Okay? Uh, there are other examples of this kind of concept of pharmacogenomics, using genetic information to help treat patients. Um, and uh, we'll talk about today how um, genomics can be used not only after the fact as a test, but also before the fact to identify gene variants that are associated with toler tolerance or um, uh, inability to handle certain drugs. Um, here's another example. So uh, CYP2C9 uh, is the one I showed you on the previous slide. There's another one called CYP2C2D6. These are enzymes um, that uh, basically perform detoxification functions in the body. And it turns out that there are alleles of CYP2D6, this other one, um, that correlate with the body's ability to metabolize many, many, many commonly used drugs. So uh, over 40 drugs, inclu including commonly used heart medications, painkillers, antidepressants, okay? And so, uh, again, the, the proper treatments in these cases really depend on what allele of this gene the patient has, okay? And so testing patients for what genotype they have at this gene, the CYP2D6 genotype, can give a doctor a lot of information about whether they want to use that drug on someone, whether the dose should be different, um, and so on. And then the, the final thing I want to say about using genomics to treat disease um, is something that we'll return to in a later lecture, um, but I just want to bring up now, which is that ultimately, um, one way we can think about using genetic information to help with the d disease is actually to change genes inside people, okay? For example, let's say that a particular medication was your only hope of, of dealing with uh, some disease, but you were unlucky enough to have the wrong variant of, of this gene, and so you can't tolerate that medication. Well, uh, one, at least in principle, solution you could have to, to, to that problem is to change this gene make it into the version that, that's good for metabolizing drugs. Um, that's not been done, okay, and it may never be done, but at least in principle it's something we should think about. Um, and uh, we call that process of, of sort of fixing genes in people gene therapy. And um, gene therapy can be broadly divided into two types of gene therapy, okay? They're called somatic gene therapy and germline gene therapy. And what you'll learn in a later lecture is it's, you know, it's technically possible to do these things, okay? There are, there are ethical issues involved in doing these things, and there are medical issues in, involved in doing these things, um, and there are still some technical challenges to overcome. But in principle, this is perfectly possible right now to do either one of these things. Um, so the difference is somatic gene therapy, so SOMA is Latin for body, okay? So somatic gene therapy is taking sort of, imagine an adult's cell, so take my blood cells out of me, fix them, and put them back into me, okay? That's taking some cells somewhere in the body and fixing their genes, okay? And germline gene therapy is something quite different, which is to affect the cells that could become uh, gametes, okay? That is, could become 
an embryo and adu an adult at some later time. That is changing the sort of genetic composition, not only of the individual, but all of their progeny and, po and potential, you know, progenies, 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 progenies. Okay? So somatic gene therapy is not seen as particularly ethically questionable. That is because you're only affecting that one individual. There are many treatments we have where, you know, cells of someone's body are taken out and modified and put back in, you know, or, or um, cells from someone's body are actually put into another person's body. Think of an organ transplant, for instance. Um, these kind of things are done um, fairly routinely now. Um, but it turns out that it's actually difficult to do when it comes to gene therapy because, as I've told you, your body contains trillions of cells. And any particular tissue that might be affected by a disease probably is millions of cells or, or more. Um, and so to, to change genes in all those cells becomes a very challenging thing to do, and we'll talk about that in later lectures. Uh, but the short um, version of that is just to say that somatic gene therapy is, is difficult. People are trying it. There are various uh, clinical trials going on now to do that for various diseases. But it's very difficult. It's technically challenging. Uh, but n there's not too much of an ethical problem with it. Germline gene therapy is the opposite, okay? So um, it turns out that it's actually easier to do germline gene therapy than it is to do somatic gene ther therapy because one way to think about it is if you do in vitro fertilization and there's a bad gene carried in a sperm or an egg, you just fix that one gene. You don't have to fix that gene in millions and millions of cells. You just have to do it in one cell and then use that cell to say if it's sperm to fertilize an egg. And then you get an individual that can grow up into an adult that has that fixed gene. That, as you'll see in a, in a later lecture, is actually technically quite easy. It's done all, all the time with other mammals. So it's done all the time with mice, for example. Okay? It's not done with humans. Um, and the reason it's not done with humans, at least for now, is that it's ethically questionable whether it's a good idea to change the germline of a human being. That is, to make a permanent modification to a human genome that can be passed on indefinitely. Okay, so we'll get back to talking about these things, but I just want to bring them up now that, that we're going to talk today about uses of genetic knowledge in medicine, in diagnosis, um, but uh, this is sort of the ultimate frontier, okay, using genetic knowledge to actually change genes inside people. Okay, so today's lecture is on genomics for diagnosis. Um, and the questions we're going to look at are, how is genomics advancing disease research? Um, and how will genomics be used to diagnose patients? Okay, so um, I want to go back to this uh, DLBCL example. So as I said, this is a common um, leukemia that, that uh, occurs a lot, so 25,000 cases per year in the United States. And remember, there are these two groups. So there are some patients that do really well with chemotherapy and others don't respond to the chemotherapy at all. It doesn't treat their cancer um, in any meaningful way. Um, and as I said, there's no, co no correlation between the morphology of the tumor cells, that is how they look under a microscope, and which type of patient you're looking at. Okay? So um, one of the things that was considered was maybe the different cancers have different genetic signatures in a way. You could tell these apart by looking at uh, genes in, in the different patient populations and then come up with some way of diagnosing the disease um, that doesn't have to do with looking under a microscope but has to do with looking at the activity of, of particular genes. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, but I want to give you a little bit more information about leukemias, uh, blood cell cancers, so we can talk about this particular example. Um, traditionally, cancers of the blood have been classified by the type of blood cell from which they arise. So these are just some examples. Um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, T-cell tumors, um, and B-cell tumors. Ho Hodgkin's lymphoma is actually a type of B-cell tumor, but it's a very, very special type, so it's given its own category. Um, and the reason that these leukemias are characterized this way, by the type of cell that, pr that uh, turns into those cancers, um, is that a basic premise of cancer biology for a really long time has been that the tumor cells inherit characteristics from the non-tumor cells that they come from, okay? Um, so that is that a, a cancer that develops out of a B cell is going to be different from a cancer that develops out of a T cell. A cancer that develops out of a muscle cell is going to be different from a cancer that develops out of a lung cell, 
Okay? And that's why these categorizations have existed. Um, and not only that, but um, another part of this premise is that the stage of the cell when it becomes cancerous is also important. And we're going to talk about different stages of B cells. Okay, so in particular, B cell tumors are classified as to whether they come from, and I'll explain what these terms mean in a second, whether they come from so-called germinal center B cells or activated B cells um, or resting B cells. Okay, so the type of cell and what stage it is in its own development can have an effect on the type of cancer that you get out of it. Okay, now the issue, as I said, is that the stage of the progenitor cell is not always obvious from the appearance of the tumor cell under a microscope. Okay? And so if there is some other way to get at that, that information, then that, that could be really useful. And so uh, what I'm going to show you today is how a particular genomic technology that we've talked about before, microarrays, can actually help do this. So a little bit more background about B cells. So B cells are uh, white blood cells. They're made in your bone marrow. And they're the cells in your body that produce antibodies. Okay, so if you get an infection, then you have these cells with antibodies that attach to uh, particular molecules that are derived from, say, a virus or a bacterium that's infecting you. And those molecules are called antigens. Okay, so uh, I'm showing here an antigen as a square and an antibody as this sort of angled thing that's a cell surface receptor. You've seen an example of a cell surface re receptor before when I talked about the yeast cells that were sticking to each other. And it's the same principle here, that, that these uh, antibodies are basic receptors for molecules of a particular shape. Okay? And each B cell that's produced has uh, a different antibody that it makes. Okay, and that's why we can, be, we can develop immunity and fight off lots of different diseases, because each of our B cells can attack something slightly different. So let's say you're infected by a bacterium that has a particular uh, protein that it makes uh, on its cell surface, and it has this shape, okay, square. Um, and that shape only really attaches to the B cells with this red antibody on it, not the purple one, not the orange one. Okay? Whereas some other bacterium uh, might produce a protein or something else that these other B cells recognize. Okay? So you have to imagine you know, many, many, many B cells floating around your blood, and they're all pretty much on the lookout for something different. Okay? Uh, so this red one is on the lookout for this red square. Okay? And most of the time, it doesn't find it. Right? Most of the time, most of your antibody-producing cells, most of your B cells are just sort of sitting around waiting, like, where, where is this thing? Where is this thing? Um, but occasionally what happens is you do get infected with something, and the B cells that recognize those antigens produced by the thing that's infecting you bind to that antigen, and then that leads to what's called activation of those uh, B cells. So this B cell becomes activated, which I showed by a little star. Okay? Now, once it's activated, that B cell, B cell starts behaving differently. Instead of sort of circulating around in your circulatory system, that B cell then goes to your lymph nodes, okay, and in particular to a place in the lymph, in lymph nodes called a germinal center. Okay? So um, inside your lymph nodes, which are all over your body, um, there are places called germinal centers that these B cells go after they've been activated. Okay? So it's almost like you know, their number got called, and then they go to that particular room in the, in the uh, you know, Department of Motor Vehicles or something, right? There's a, okay, you're up, come over here. And where they go is the germinal center, right? And what, what happens at the germinal center is a really, really interesting genetic process, okay? So as I said, each of these B cells is going to be producing different antibodies so that all these different potential invaders to your body can be recognized. Um, but the antibody is not necessarily perfect for the thing that's actually infecting you. So um, it, this B cell will get activated, but it might not be the best possible B cell that could be made to, to deal with this antigen. Okay? So what happens in the germinal center is, is actually really cool. What happens is the genes that make these receptors, that make the antibodies, um, start mutating intentionally. Okay, usually mutation is a bad thing, right? Um, but these cells start mutating intentionally, and there's a selection process that happens inside the germinal center so that the B cells that are better at sticking to the antigen survive, and the ones that are worse at sticking to the antigen die. 
And so what happens there is the same thing that happens, you know, if you're selecting for the flowers you like out, out in your garden, right? Um, what you get is better and better B cells, better cells that are better and better, making better and better antibodies to attach to the antigen that's infecting you, that's coming from the thing that's infecting you, okay? So it's basically a sort of learning process so that you get better B cells, and that all happens in your lymph nodes in these germinal centers, okay? And then the B cells that have been selected, these better B cells, then get released back into your bloodstream, and they can go attack more of these cells that are from the invader, basically, the, the bacteria or the virus that's invading you. Okay, does that make sense? Right. So these are actually real physical things. You can see a germinal center under the microscope. So this is uh, part of a lymph node. So you take a lymph node out of someone. This was, I don't know if this was a someone or if it was a mouse or something. Um, it'll, it'll look pretty much the same. You take a lymph node out, um, and inside it are these discrete places, and this is the germinal center. Okay, so this is where activated B cells are that are learning to uh, deal with a particular invader by making better and better antibodies. Okay? And so the question we want to ask then is, do cancers that come from activated B cells act differently from cancers that are coming from B cells that are already in the germinal center, um, and so on. And so, uh, as I told you, this is a question we can't ask using a microscope because it doesn't help us. Um, and so, what we can ask, though, is whether these cells, for example, these B cells that are already in the germinal center have a different gene activity than, gene, than B cells that are not in the germinal center, than activated B cells somewhere else, okay? Um, and we can go further and say, do particular cancers, do these different DLBCL types have gene activities that match either the germinal center B cells or the activated B cells or some other type of B cell, okay? So potentially by looking at gene activity, we can identify where particular cancers are coming from and that might actually help us partition the ones that can be treated with chemotherapy and the ones that can't be treated with chemotherapy, okay? So these are basically the kinds of questions we're gonna try and answer with microarrays. Do germinal, bent B cent germinal center B cells have a different expression profile that has a different gene activity uh, for you know, any particular gene in the genome distinct from other B cells? And do the tumors have different gene activity profiles that correlate with where that uh, cell might have become cancerous, okay? So just to remind you um, what a microarray is, right? It's these uh, glass slides, or sometimes they're fabricated slightly differently, but glass slide is good enough for us, um, with lots of spots on them, and each spot corresponds to a gene, and then we can use those to tell whether a particular gene is active more or less in one sample versus another sample, right? Um, and so the experiment that was done in this case, and this is a real experiment I'm going to be telling you about on DLBCL, uh, used microarrays where there are about 18,000 human genes that are being assayed. So 18,000 spots on this array that are being looked at to see how the gene activity changes, okay? And they used 96 different blood cell samples, okay? So 46 of those samples were from patients with DLBCL, so these are the actual cancer patients that they're interested in. They looked at uh, blood cell samples from people with different types of leukemia, so this is uh, CLL, it's a different type of leukemia. Uh, FL is a different type of leukemia. Um, and then they looked at other cell types, so non-cancerous cell types. So they looked at resting B cells. These are the B cells that have not yet been activated by any antigen. Activated B cells, so these are B cells that are activated in your bloodstream. Germinal center B cells, so B cells that were activated went to the germinal center and then were isolated from the germinal center. T cells, which are a different type of white blood cell. Um, six uh, laboratory cell lines that are just traditionally used when studying blood cells. Um, and then two samples just straight from uh, tonsils or lymph nodes, okay? And so the hope was that by looking at all of these samples and looking at which genes were active in which one, you might be able to pick out signatures that say different DLBCL patients had gene activity profiles that were more similar to say activated B cells or resting B cells or germinal center B cells and then you could try and correlate that with how well they responded to chemotherapy, okay? So the first thing I have to point out here is that this is an enormous experiment, 
Okay? You have 18,000 genes that are being looked at in 96 different samples. Okay? So if you count all the little pieces of data that come out of this experiment, it's 1.8 million pieces of data. Okay? So you've done experiments in labs, so like where you uh, do a restriction digest and run a gel, that's three pieces of data. Right? One enzyme, the other enzyme, both enzymes together. Okay? So you have to try and get your head around the scale of this experiment. This is 1.8 million pieces of data that are going to come out of this experiment. And that presents a lot of challenges, right? You can't just put 1.8 million pieces of data into a, a spreadsheet and then go scanning down the list and trying to find out, you know, this gene is active or not active more or less than this other. It's just impractical to go through that much data, okay? So what I'm going to show you now is how you deal with cases where there's this much data. Um, and it's actually fairly straightforward, except for the fact that it's so much data. Okay? And it's a very useful way to think about things when you have this much data, which is why I want to go through it in some detail. Okay? So the first thing we have to do is we, f we have to figure out a good way to organize the data that we get. Right? We have 18,000 genes. We have 96 blood samples. What's the best way to put these things together so that we have some nice format where we can start to analyze it and find meaningful information from it? Okay? And so what we do is we start by actually making a table. We make a, basically a spreadsheet from the data. Okay? And what we do is we, s is we make each row in that table correspond to one of these genes. So this spot right here is going to be row one in the table. Okay? And the next spot is going to be row two in the table. And the next spot, row three, row four. Okay? And so altogether, we're going to have 18,000 rows in this table. Right? Big table, 18,000 rows. And each column in the table is going to be one of the samples. So we have 96 samples, right? Um, and so we're going to have those different samples each be a column. And I'm giving them different colors because some of them are going to come from DLBCL. Some of them are going to come from activated B cells, OK? So each of these ones are coming from a different source of cells. And each one is its own column in the table. So if we wanted to look up the activity of a particular gene in a particular sample, we'd say, OK, let's say we're interested in sample number four and gene number four. Then we look right here, and that's going to be where that piece of data is. And if we have 96 by 18,000, then there are going to be 1.8 million boxes here that get filled in. Okay. Now, if that's all we did, um, it would still be enormously difficult to try and get any meaningful information out of it, because you'd be staring at a, a very, very large number of numbers. Okay? So how do we actually um, do something that, that makes uh, patterns jump out of the data easily? What we do is a procedure that's, that goes under the name of clustering. Okay? And we're going to go through how that works in a very simplified situation. So we're not going to deal with 96 by 18,000. We're going to deal with a situation where we have seven samples and eight genes. And we're going to look at how we can organize data to, to, to find patterns. Okay? So here's the data set we're going to look at in this sort of toy example. So as I said, samples are in columns. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? And genes are in rows, genes one through eight. Okay? And I color coded them instead of putting numbers there, because it's much easy, easier for us to see differences in color than it is to see differences in numbers. Okay? And this example is really simple because basically, in this example, either a gene is on or it's off. Okay? And so we really only have two colors here. We have this uh, magenta color, which is high activity of a gene, and we have this green color, which is low activity of a gene. Okay? You've seen this before as like red and green. Okay? I'm making this magenta and green because if any in the anyone in the room is colorblind, they can't tell the difference between red and green, but they can tell the difference between magenta and green. So for those probably males in the room who are uh, colorblind, this is for you. Um, OK, so this is our data set, right? So here we only have 56 pieces of data, because we have seven columns and eight rows. And we have a very simpl simplified situation where the, the gene is either on or it's off. It's either high activity or low activity. And when we say high activity or low activity for a gene in a microarray experiment, remember what we're talking about is basically how much messenger RNA there is, how much mRNA is present in the sample. OK, so if this were a real example, you'd see all shades of colors in between magenta and green also. Okay, uh, But this is just to simplify. So 
the point that I want you to get from looking at even this simplified situation is it's hard to see patterns in the data um, as it is. Okay, we have this sort of like patchwork of, of magenta and green spots, but it's not really telling us anything uh, right away. Okay, but we what we do, what clustering is, is to reorganize where the rows are and where the columns are, and what you'll see is that that starts to make patterns in the data really jump out. Okay, so in particular, we can rearrange the order of the columns. Okay, so switch these around. Um, and that makes samples that are similar to each other stand out. Okay, so I'm just going to show you the reordering. Okay, now the only difference between the previous slide and this slide is now the samples are in the order one six two five four three seven instead of one two three four five six seven. Okay, and so what you can see right away is that one and six basically have identical gene activity profiles. Okay, sample one goes green, magenta, green, green, magenta, green, green, magenta, and so does sample six. Okay, so that means for any gene here, sample one and six are responding exactly the same. You have low activity, high activity, low, low, high, low, low, high. Okay, um, the same is true of two and five. The same is true of three and seven, and then four is different by itself. Okay, so just by sort of shifting the order around, that sort of helps us look at these. Um, and it wasn't by accident that I made uh, these both purple, so that was like the DL, uh, CBL um, example, and these blue, like the activated B cell example. So uh, what we expect to see is that samples from the same tissue are going to have similar activity profiles and sort of group together, okay? And that is going to be a way to help us look at that. You can do the same thing ordering genes, okay? So we can reorder the genes. Instead of one through eight, we can change the order so that genes with very similar um, profiles across samples go together, okay? And then you get something that looks like this. So here, the samples are in the same order as on the previous slide, and now I've reordered the genes. So it goes one, four, six, seven, and so on, right? And so this helps you see, for example, that gene five and gene two have exactly the same um, expression in all of these samples, okay? And gene four and gene six have exactly the same expression in all of these samples, right? And so these data, are exactly the same as those data. We've just reordered them, OK? And what that allows us to do is really pick out that there are some clear patterns here, OK? That um, these genes behave very similar to one another um, across all the samples. These genes behave very similar to each other across all these samples. Um, these two samples are basically identical in terms of their gene expression activity. Uh, these are identical to each other. These are identical to each other. And then we can, what's nice about this too is we can find sort of uh, key differences too. So if you look at genes five, two, and eight, they're almost all identical except gene eight has very low activity in sample four, whereas genes two and five have high activity in sample four. So that might be an important difference uh, for example, um, if this was a difference between um, sort of a cancer and a non-cancer state, then this might be a gene that was sort of directly involved in that difference. Okay, it becomes a candidate for that difference. So um, clustering the data like this gives you a much more interpretable picture than that original picture we started with. That's the, that's the main point. Um, and so I want to go through how you do the clustering, how you get from, how did I know what order to put these rows and columns in, okay? And it's actually a very simple operation that's very, very similar to how we made a, an evolutionary tree, how we decided which organisms are closely related to one another when we had DNA sequences, okay? Um, and so we follow this very, very simple rule, which is that the first thing we do, so let's say we're clustering the columns, so we want to reorder these columns from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven to some order that makes more sense. The first thing we do is we find the two most similar samples and place their columns next to each other. Okay? So for that, we can say, okay, column one looks identical to column six, so we can place those two together. Okay? So we find those two and then we move them. Okay? So everything else is in the same order so far, two, three, four, five, seven, but we've moved one and six next to each other. Okay? And then we find the next two most similar, okay? So we have two and five that are very similar to one another. In fact, they're identical, okay? So we pick out those columns and we move them together, 
Okay, so now two and five are together. And you can see that as I do this, I put brackets next to the ones I've connected. Okay, because essentially we are making a tree here. We're making a tree of relatedness of these samples. Then we find the next ones, three and seven. Okay, and we put those two together, right? Um, and then four doesn't re really belong with any of them. But this group is actually very similar to this group. The only difference is in gene three. Okay? So the next most similar grouping to make is actually to put this group with this group. Okay? And the way we represent that is by drawing another bracket up here. You can see the sort of tree-like shape starting to take form. Okay? These are very closely related to each other. These are very closely related to each other. And then these two groups are actually quite closely related to each other with only one difference in the gene here. And so this is basically what happens as the clustering proceeds, is you get groups of groups forming, okay? Until eventually, um, you have a complete tree that shows all of these relationships, okay? So um, one and six, two and five, and then those are grouped together, those group with four, and then three and seven are very different um, and group sort of outside all of that. It's sort of like an evolutionary tree where these might be sort of human and chimpanzee and mouse and rat and chicken and two fish or something like that. It's this basically the same kind of thing. We're grouping things by similarity. And I've also done the same grouping on the rows. Okay, we get a tree over here for the rows, putting these things together. And so this final uh, picture, which I showed you previously, sort of out of the blue, comes from this sort of gradual changing of the order of things, just putting the most similar things together with each other. And that allows you to see the patterns. Okay? Any questions about that before I show you what the real data look like from this DLBCL experiment? Excellent question. So the question is, well, okay, so if you have seven samples and eight genes, we can do it by I, right? How do you do it when you have 1.8 1, 1 million pieces of data? Um, well, if you think about it, the way we're putting these two together is basically in our head, we're, we're computing something called a correlation. We're asking how similar is this column to this column, okay? And there's actually a mathematical formula you can use to say how similar this column is to this column. Okay? And you get what's called a correlation coefficient. And so a computer is really good at computing a correlation coefficient. And in fact, it doesn't care if you have eight things that are correlated or 1.8 million that are correlated. It'll still compute the same thing and do it very fast. And so in reality, what you do is you have your original spreadsheet. You run a computer program that computes all of these correlations. And then it just gives you this ordering. Uh, very fast, actually. It's, um, so, okay, so th this is our sort of toy example of how this works, but this is done a lot. I mean, this is a, this is a huge, huge method that's used for genomic data nowadays. Um, and so I want to show you what the real data look like, uh, both because they sort of give you some indication of how sort of messy and complicated real data are compared to toy data. Um, and also because in this particular case with DLBCL, it actually leads to discovery. It actually leads to results that are important um, in terms of the treatment of, of this particular disease. Okay? So don't get scared, but here's the real data. So basically what we have here, remember, is 18,000 genes. So each of the rows here is tiny. right? It's a little sliver of a line going across here, 18,000 rows, okay? and 96 columns. And the 96 columns are the different samples, right? And here, we, here we're going green to red because that's how we're, they were shown in the original publication. So red means high activity of the gene. Green means uh, low activity of the gene, OK? And so each row is a gene. So you can read off across samples what any particular gene is doing. So it's low, 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 high, 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 low, 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 low right? And, um, What's shown up here color-coded is which sample they actually came from. So the purple ones are the, the cancer we're interested in, the DLBCL. Okay? Um, the orange ones, which are embedded in here, are germinal center cells. Okay? Um, the blue ones here are activated B cells.
okay, and here are some more purple DLBCL ones, okay, and then there are these other tissues, these other cell lines, these other cancer types, um, and uh, other types of B cells, T cells, okay. So these, are th that's what the real data look like, and they're they're a little bit hard to digest at first, okay. But the idea is, so these are already clustered, okay. So it looks a little messy, but these are already clustered, and, and one of the indications you can see of that is this sort of part here that's mostly red and this part here that's mostly green, okay? That's because the columns have already been reorganized, the rows have already been reorganized to sort of maximize the blockiness of this uh, diagram. So here you see again a group of genes where there's um, high activity in these samples, okay? And low activity in all these samples, okay? And What's interesting first is, is where, the, um, where all of these uh, purple ones show up. Okay? So there's a big group of them here that cluster together. That means those particular DLBCL samples are very similar in terms of what their genes are doing. Okay? They have very similar gene activity. Where are these, there, whereas there are these ones over here that are very different in terms of their gene activity. Okay? Purple, purple, purple from those. Okay? And the other thing you can see is that the, the germinal center B cells, so these are non-cancer cells, these are just B cells that come out of the germinal center, are sitting right in the middle of all these purple ones, okay? So that's an indication, it sort of leads to the hypothesis, that, um, the, that a large class of DLBCL cancers arises from the germinal center, okay? Um, because their gene activity profiles are just so similar, okay? Um, The other thing we see is that there are groups of genes that basically are sort of responding very, very similarly across all the samples. So there's small groups where you see green, red, green, red, green, red, green, okay? So that's one set of genes that's all pretty much doing the same thing across all these samples. Here's a bigger set of genes, you know, that's high activity, low activity, high activity, low activity, high activity, low activity, high activity, low activity. So there are these sets of genes that come out, and these can be really useful both for diagnosis, as you'll see, and also for research, because they tell you genes that are specific to partic particular cell types uh, in their activity, okay? And as I already mentioned, the clustering of the columns shows which samples are related to one another, and that's what becomes really useful to us in terms of figuring out um, these two different populations of patients that have DLBCL, okay? So, um, one of the things we can do is sort of zoom in on a particular area of this plot, okay? And so this one, for example, is interesting because um, there is a set of genes that are active in a subset of uh, patients with DLBCL and in these germinal center B cells, okay? Um, and they have low expression in most other cases except this other type of leukemia, okay? So uh, that might be an interesting uh, set of genes to look at, okay? And if we blow up the, just that section of the diagram, okay? So if we go from, uh, sorry, just this slice, and we basically blow it up, so that's all we're looking at. It looks like this, okay? And this is what the authors of this paper term the germinal center genes. And the reason is that if you look at these, these uh, orange samples, which are the germinal center B cell samples, all of these genes have re really strong red. They're high activity in germ germinal center B cells, okay? And as I said, some of the purples, some of the patients with DLBCL also have high activity in those genes, okay? So those might be uh, important that in those cases, those patients might have cancers that arose from the germinal center, okay? You can also pick out from the original plot um, a similar set of genes that are activated B cell genes, and I'm not showing you that blow up, but basically you can imagine that there's another part of that original chart, and you can look for it on, on the previous slide, where there's a lot of red here, where these uh, blue samples are, the activated B cells, okay? There's a lot of red there, and then there are some purples that also have a lot of red there, okay? And so, um, that leads to the possibility that the 
germinal center B cells and the activated B cells can be told apart by a genetic test, basically. They, just by looking at gene activity, you can tell whether a B cell is activated or a germinal center. Um, and potentially, that different cancers that arise from these different cells might actually have different properties. Okay? And so what was done next was to take just those germinal center genes, okay, so that's these, all of these genes, all of these rows of the table, and the activated B cell genes, and you can see here what those look like. These are blue samples. These are the activated B cell samples, and there's a lot of red right here. Okay. And to focus just on this set of samples, so the set of samples that are either DLBCL cases or the actual germinal center samples, and recluster those. Okay? So we send them through the same procedure and reordering, but focusing only on a smaller subset of genes and just that subset of samples. Okay? And hopefully that will lead to an even more focused picture of what's going on. And in fact, it does quite dramatically. Okay? So if we just take that subset of genes and that subset of samples, what we get is this picture. Okay? And so again, you have clustering of rows. So these genes are all behaving very similarly, and these genes are behaving very similarly. Okay? And we have a set of samples that are very similar to each other, and another set of samples that are very similar to each other. And these are the ones that were originally purple. Okay, so all of these are DLBCL samples. But when we look at just these genes, um, they basically partition into two groups. Okay? They partition into a group that's called the activated B-like DLBCL, because those are ones where they have high activity, the red, for the activated B cells, and low activity for these uh, germinal center genes. And then we have these ones that are called germinal center B-like, the orange ones, um, where they have high activity for these genes we already knew had high activity in germinal center cells, and low activity for these genes that we already knew had high activity in activated B cells. Okay? So basically, we've gone from this really complicated data set down to something that's a little simpler. I mean, it's still a little bit complicated to look at because it's not just red or green. You have all these shades of color going on here. But if you sort of stand back, and probably the people in the back of the room can see this better than the people in the front of the room, it looks like green, red, red, green. Okay? And, and that tells you that there are these different groups of genes that are basic, basically diagnostic of whether you have a cell that came from the germinal center or one that came from an activated B cell. Um, and you can see that again because in black here is the actual germinal center B samples. Okay, so and they're sitting within. They're very closely related to these orange ones, which are actually cancer cells that are uh, presumably derived from the germinal center. Okay, so that's all really interesting. It can lead to a lot of new hypotheses for people who are studying the disease. Right, they can focus on these genes and try and understand why um, having this set of genes um, active might be important. For example, they could try and figure out which genes are active um, in the cancer samples that are not active in the germinal center B samples, that is, what makes those cancerous. You can try and figure that out. Um, and the other thing you can do is you can use these tests now. This becomes a diagnostic test for basically which type of cancer you're looking at. Originally, we only had one type. It was DLBCL. But what this does is, is it allows you to partition into two types. If I gave, another way to think about that is if I gave you a new sample, if I said, here's a patient that has DLBCL, okay, and I do the microarray and I give you their gene expression profile and it looks like red, 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 green, 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 then you would just instantly be able to classify that patient. You'd say that patient has a germinal center B-like gene activity profile. Okay? Whereas if I gave you one, you know, patient comes in, draw their blood, do the microarray, and you find green, 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 red, 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 you'd say, okay, this patient has a DLBCL cancer that looks like activated B-like. Okay? Now, the real clincher is that that actually matters. Okay? Which cancer you have, which of those two types, um, is really important. Okay? And that's what's shown here. So what's shown here is what's called a survival curve. Okay? 
So on the x-axis is the overall survival in years since diagnosis. Okay, so um, this is a cancer that certainly can kill you, okay? And so what's measured here is at the beginning of the study, everyone's alive, okay? It's a little bit morbid to think about, but what you do is as the study goes on, um, you ask what percentage of patients are still alive, okay? And for this disease in general, it goes down, okay? So by, for example, you know, 10 years out, um, in, uh, you know, fewer than 50% of the patients that were there in the original study would still be alive. Okay, so this is a really serious disease, right? Um, and what's shown here, though, is not just, just DLBCL, but what happens if you, if you categorize the patient as having this G germinal center-like cancer or the activated B-like cancer, okay? Whether their cancer started in the germinal center or whether their cancer, cancer started with an activated B-cell in the bloodstream, okay? And so what's shown is a really dramatic result, which is that after, say, six years, there's only about 20% of the patients still surviving that had this type of cancer, but there's about 70% that had this kind of cancer, okay? So the type, of the type of cancer they have and the response to chemotherapy that they have is dramatically different, okay? If someone comes in, then, so the way to think about it is, right, I said you could turn this into a diagnostic test. And basically what you'd be saying is if someone came in and had red, 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 green, 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 you'd classify them as a germinal center B type cancer, and you'd say that's a good sign for you, okay, because you're in this group. You have a much higher probability of survival. But if someone came in and had green, 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 red, 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 you'd have to deliver the bad news, which is that they're in this group. Okay? And it turns out that people in this group basically don't respond to chemotherapy. Okay, the treatment that's used that makes these people survive is essentially not effective in these patients, and that's why they die. Okay? And so, um, as I said at the beginning, you know, this is not, you know, this is not 100% information about what to do, right? It, it doesn't automatically say, okay, so your treatment must be such and such if, if you're in this group, okay? But um, it's the kind of information that can go into one of these really complex life decisions. So if, if a doctor came to you and said, you know, I have really bad news, you're in this group, uh, most people in this group don't respond to chemotherapy, um, you have a choice, right? And that's the only, th as of now, that's the only possible treatment. It's either chemotherapy or nothing, right? Um, basically, at that point, you have a choice. You say, well, I'm going to go for it anyway. I'm going to go for the chemotherapy. But going for the chemotherapy means um, a really, really debilitating course of treatment, right? Um, chemotherapy is not at all pleasant. Um, in many cases, chemotherapy can kill you. Um, and so um, you can go for it, but you have a much lower probability of that working than if you were in this group. Um, and some people actually opt for not doing the chemotherapy, um, treating symptoms, so doing what's called palliative care, um, and trying to enjoy whatever time they have li left instead of being in a hospital with chemotherapy. And that's not an easy decision for anyone to make, um, but at least, um, it's a decision that's a, a little bit more informed when you can do a test like this. Um, because prior to a test like this, basically everyone would go on the chemotherapy because they wouldn't know which, which group they were in. The other thing having this knowledge does is to really spur research, right? Because now that you know these two groups of patients are different, you can recognize right away which group a per particular person is in. You can, for example, collect a group of patients that have this type and study them and try and figure out why their cancer is so different and try and find therapeutic targets for their particular type of the cancer um, that might actually turn into viable treatments um, that uh, where, as of now, there are actually no treatments available for those patients. This kind of thing of using genomics to try and understand, develop diagnostics, and ultimately spark research into uh, treatment 
has been used a lot for different types of cancers. So um, this is another type of uh, uh, leukemia. Okay, so there's uh, ALL, which is acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, it's uh, an overproliferation of immature B and T cells. So, so um, early stage B and T cells get transformed into cancer cells, and they overproliferate. Um, AML is called acute myeloid leukemia, and it's not an overproliferation of B and T cells. It's other types of white blood cells that overproliferate. Both of these, there are a large number of cases per year in the U.S. ALL is the most common form of childhood leukemia. Okay, so 80% of children with leukemia have ALL. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, research into trying to find out how to how to help patients with these diseases. And um, if you if you do the same type of study where you do microarrays on people with ALL and people with AML. Um, you can actually distinguish the two diseases very easily by gene expression. So here, sorry, another color scheme, red is high and blue is low. Um, and so again, you have this sort of set of genes and another set of genes where they're pretty much diagnostic for which type of cancer you have. So um, you have a big block of red, a big block of blue, a big block of blue, and a bl big block of red. So basically, if you're red, 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 blue, 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 you have ALL, and if you're blue, 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 red, 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 then, you're, then you have AML. Okay? And the same types of studies are being done there to try and um, sort of tailor treatments to particular cases to develop new research strategies to try and understand um, what's, uh, what the potential roads to treatment are for these two different types of leukemia. Same kind of thing is done with breast cancers. Okay, so this is an example from your article that you're reading. The only thing you have to do with this one is turn your head 90 degrees, okay? So instead of having genes in rows and samples in columns, this one is genes in columns and samples in rows. So if you turn your head like this, you'll see it perfectly. Um, I didn't turn it back over because this is the way it actually appears in your article, so I didn't want you to get too confused. Um, so if you turn your head like this, again, what you see is these blocks of genes, okay, that are different across samples, and then these are different types of breast cancers, okay? And you didn't necessarily know that when you started the study, okay? Basically what you have is a bunch of samples from patients with breast cancer, and then you discover by doing this kind of analysis that they fall into subgroups um, with different gene activity profiles, okay? And again, the importance of doing this is really, really high because depending on which group you're in, depending on whether you're this gene activity profile or this one or this one or this one, the survivorship rates are really different, okay? So if you ask which, what fraction of patients that have one of these samples versus one of these versus one of these versus one of these have metastatic cancer, that is cancer that originates as breast cancer but then spreads to other parts of the body, um, the differences are really dramatic, okay? So if, if you're in this group, basically, um, the, the frequency of metastatic cancer is really low. Okay? In this sample of 20 people, uh, none of those patients develop metastatic cancer. Okay? So that's sort of the good news group. Right? In this group, 29% had metastatic cancer. And you can see that there's, there's a, only a very subtle difference between this gene activity profile and this one. But the computer can pick it out. It can put these groups together and this group together. Okay? And then that subtle difference actually has a huge difference in outcome, okay? This pattern, which is basically the opposite of these two, green and then red, 75% metastatic cancer, okay? So this, this group and this one also are the bad news groups, okay? Uh, if, you have, if you come to the clinic and you get your microarray done and you have this pattern, okay, um, that's not a very good prognosis um, because uh, many of the patients, 75% of the patients in this study with that gene expression profile develop metastatic cancer. And it's metastatic cancer that's, that's the really sort of life-threatening, dangerous um, stage. So we can also just sort of view that um, on one of these survivor curves. And you see basically the same thing we saw in the leukemia example, which is that um, so again, this is sort of time. Uh, this is in months, not years, right? Okay, so 240 months would be 
20 years, right? Um, and so if you have what's called a good prognosis expression profile, okay? So um, one of uh, these versus whether you had a bad prognosis expression profile, so one of these, um, it makes a huge difference in survivorship, okay? So, you know, this is more than 10 years out, right? Um, uh, patients with the sort of good prognosis expression profile, 80% um, were still free of metastases, okay? Um, so basically, very, very little spreading of that cancer. This group, um, you know, fewer than 10 years out, 80% um, had metastases, okay? And, and you can be sure that those translate into survivorship differences. And so, um, microarrays are, are still a little bit expensive, okay? And so, um, there aren't a lot of examples that I know of, at least, of, of cases where you would go into the clinic, get a preliminary diagnosis, and then get a microarray done on you to actually put you into one of these categories. Um, but instead, what, what various uh, diagnostic testing companies have developed is um, to just take a subset of genes, so not doing the whole microarray, you don't need to do all 20,000 genes, you can just do the genes that actually give you information, like these genes, okay? So pick a bunch of these genes and a bunch of these genes, right? And that should be enough information to say, um, you know, which class you're in, right? So if, if, you, if you had a test where you tested, say, a few of these and a few of these, and they were low activity, high activity, then you'd say, okay, you're in this group, this is the bad diagnosis group, right? But if you had high activity, low activity, then you're in the good, good diagnosis group, okay? And so that's been done by um, a few companies already. Um, so there's one test that's called Oncotype DX. Um, and this test is, is um, an interesting one because it, it, it's associated with studies that were done to see whether breast cancer recurred. Okay, so there, um, breast cancer, as you know, is very common. Um, in some fortunate cases, um, you can get treated and the breast cancer basically goes into remission, right? Um, but there's some probability, there's some chance of um, recurrence. That is, you've been treated, you go off the treatment, and then the cancer comes back, okay? And so people have done these kind of microarray studies to say, well, is there sort of a gene activity profile that predicts whether recurrence is gonna happen, okay? Not, not sort of which type you have originally, um, but given that you had cancer, it went into remission, what's the probability that it'll come back, okay? And what they did was they found 21 genes that seem to be really good diagnostic markers. If you know that those genes activity is high or low, then you can pretty much compute what the probable uh, rate of recurrence is, okay? So that's a test that people can get now um, and it, it sort of gives you a probability of recurrence. And that, again, is something that's, that can be used in a more informed decision about treatment, right? Uh, whether you want to um, sort of do a more aggressive treatment, even though you're in remission, to make sure it doesn't come back, or whether you can feel more comfortable letting up on the treatment um, because your rate of recurrence is, is predicted to be very low, okay? Um, Here's another one, same situation, recurrence of, uh, of breast cancer. They do 70 genes, these guys do 21, these guys do 70 genes, but the principle is exactly the same, giving you a prediction about whether, um, uh, whether the cancer is going to recur. And this is, uh, this is now uh, one of the first uh, FDA approved tests for this kind of purpose. That is, um, you know, uh, the, the government has approved this as a way of uh, doctors can use to actually tell you uh, what your chance of recurrence is. Okay. Um, the other really um, important use of microarrays, um, which goes back to the sort of notion of pharmacogenomics, is you can use microarrays to tell you if a particular drug is a promising candidate to treat something, okay? And usually uh, what you're testing for is whether the drug is likely to cause really bad side effects. Um, because um, developing a new drug and bringing it to market is a really long process, 
a really long process. You have to come up with an idea that there's some rational reason why a particular drug might work on this disease. You go through a set of trials on animals and then three phases of trials on human beings before it can actually be an FDA approved drug um, that's used widely. This is a process that takes you know 10 years or longer. Um, and different parts of that process are slow for different reasons. And one of the parts of the process that's slow is determining side effects and potential toxicities because you often have to use a, a large scale animal test to do that, uh, to do that kind of study. And so um, it was thought that maybe that could be avoided in some cases where a drug is just not going to end up being promising because it's toxic um, by using gene expression ac ac uh, assays instead of just going straight to animal testing. Okay? And so the principle is that, um, and, and this again is from the article that you'll read, um, is that you can use a microarray to tell you which genes are active when a particular chemical is added to them. Okay? So you have an untreated cell, that's your control, okay? and your treated cell, so that one actually you add a drug to. And then those are going to activate different genes. Okay? And so you know, when you add a chemical to cells, uh, some of the genes are going to change their activity, as you know. Some of them are going to go more active, some of them are going to go less active. You do the standard microarray thing, which is you take the messenger RNA from this sample, you convert it into green cDNA, so color-labeled cDNA. You take the messenger RNA from this sample, you convert it into red uh, cDNA. You mix those together, you put them on a microarray, and you see what the difference is for different genes. Okay? And you get a result like this. So this is what the microarray would look, li look like. You have different spots that are various shades of red, various shades of green, and then in between, which are yellow, and then the, the black ones are ones where the gene is just not that active in either sample. Okay? And so um, remember you use a laser to scan the slide, and then you get this readout on your computer. Um, but that information, again, is really hard to look at and make sense of. So what you do is, again, you do this clustering procedure. Okay? Um, and so here again, you have to turn your head 90 degrees. So the genes are in columns, and the different chemicals are in rows. Okay? And so it's the same kind of pattern finding operation that goes on. So what, the way you do it is you say, OK, here's, here's a set of chemicals that are drugs of various kinds that aren't toxic. Okay? I know these drugs are good drugs because they don't cause bad side effects, but they're effective in some way. And so you get the gene expression profiles for those. And then you do the same thing with drugs that just never quite made it in the past. They, they were found to be too toxic, too many side effects. Okay? Um, and so that's what's shown here as these non-toxic -to substances, so drugs that don't have bad side effects, and known liver toxins, so drugs that just never made it through the pipeline because they're toxic. And what you can see, again, is this sort of standard picture you see when, when an experiment like this works out, is that you have blocks of genes. Okay? that basically are predictive of which type of chemical you added. So here you have red, 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 green, 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 green. So all of these genes okay, are either more active when a toxin is added or less active when a toxin is added. And all of these genes are either less active when uh, same gene. So all of these genes are less active when the toxin is when a non-toxic substance is added, or more active when a non-toxic su substance is added. So if you have a new drug candidate, right, you just you know, do the same kind of diagnostic. You, you run the microarray on that drug candidate, and you see what the gene expression profile is. So here's what's shown a new drug candidate. OK, red, 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 green, green, green. So for all of these genes, it has low activity. And for all of these genes, it has high activity. So looking at this, you, you can tell me whether this drug candidate is going to make it. Okay? Is that a good drug candidate? No, it's not. Because it basically clusters, it groups with known toxins. Okay? So just by doing that one experiment, you can say, this chemical just is not worth it. We're not going to proceed with this chemical. Um, it's going to, um, you know, we would get to some later stage in our, in our pipeline of drug development, and we'd find out that it had really bad side effects, so why bother with it? Okay? When there are 
when you might get a different compound, you add to the cells and you get this gene activity profile, you get low activity for these genes and high activity for these genes. Um, and you would say, okay, that's a good candidate. That's a drug that might actually work without giving too many side effects. Um, and so we're going to push forward with that drug. Okay, so there are a lot of really important uses for, um, for microarrays, for genomics in, uh, in general, in both diagnosis, in spurring research, um, and hopefully eventually in treatment. Okay, so uh, I just want to point out that the study questions for today ask you to go through an example where you get samples, okay, and you have to cluster them. So I encourage you to try that. It asks you to cluster the columns first and then the rows, okay? And then answer an interpretation question about it. Basically, it, once you get your clustered diagram and you know which genes are high and low in particular circumstances, does that make sense in terms of whether they come from healthy tissue or cancerous tissue? Can you make any judgments using that data about whether a particular gene is a good candidate for a diagnostic test or something like that? So I really encourage you to go through those questions to make sure you understand the concepts we talked about today.